Hi everybody, welcome back to Environmental Organic Chemistry with Dr. Lisa. Uh, we're going to talk about chapter 13 of the Schwartz and Bakkeschwand and Imboden textbook, Hydrolysis and Nucleophilic Reactions. Now, pretty much all of you should have taken organic chemistry already. I'm not saying you remember it, but I know you took it at one point. That's how you got into this class. Um, and so you might think as we go through here, oh, wait a minute, what Lisa is saying does not jibe with what I was taught in organic chemistry. And it's also possible that you might go onto YouTube and watch something like the Khan Academy or one of those videos to help you understand things. And that's absolutely fine, and I encourage you to do that. But you have to keep in mind that if anything you hear in this lecture seems to contradict what you learn in organic chemistry or what you learn on the Khan Academy or on YouTube, the difference is because we're environmental chemists and our solvent is water. And that changes things. Water itself is a nucleophile, and so it kind of screws everything up, and particularly it, it's, it screws up the nucleophilicity of other nucleophiles, because other, those other nucleophiles are surrounded by water molecules, and that changes their oomph, their power, in terms of being nucleophiles. And as a result, that changes some of the reactivity orders of things. So if you hear things like fluoride is the greatest nucleophile ever, and then I tell you it's not, it's because the fluoride is solvated by water molecules. So just keep that in mind as we go through here. Now, nucleophil... Yeah, this is a tough word for me. I've got to say it like a thousand times in this lecture, so bear with me. Nucleophilic reactions are important in the real world, in the world of environmental chemistry, because there's lots of nucleophiles out in this world, including, as I just mentioned, water, right? Water is actually quite a good nucleophile. So what happens is that all the chemicals that we're going to talk about, you know, whenever there's any kind of polarity any permanent dipoles, uh, that means that they have area, areas of parietal, <laughs> hey, I gotta change my slide, areas of partial positive and partial negative charge, right? And so these partial positive charges are attractive to things that are nucleophiles, that are loving positive charges and like to attack them, right? Nucleo means positive and phile means loving, like Philadelphia is the city of brotherly love. Um, so the file part means loving, so nucleophile is something that loves positive charges and would like to go attack them. And by the same token, the, the areas of partial negative charge on the molecule are attractive to electrophiles. But the problem is that electrophiles get really destroyed very rapidly because there's all these nucleophiles out there like water. So the only time when electrophiles become important in organic environmental organic chemistry is when they are generated by sunlight and that's going to be the whole lecture on photochemistry which we'll get to uh, but in the the real world that we live in water is all our solvent water is itself a nucleophile and then all of these other negatively charged species that you see here are common anions in water and can act as nucleophiles there's water itself um, doesn't have a charge, but as you can imagine, all of these other things that have negative charges on them would like to go attack a nucleus. They are nucleophiles. So most of these things are negatively charged. A few of them, like here's an amine that's not negatively charged, uh, but most of them are they're either negatively charged or they have lone pair electrons. So we know that there's lone pair electrons on the water here. We know there's a lone pair of electrons on that nitrogen, which is why it's a hydrogen bond acceptor, which is something that everybody got wrong on the midterm exam. Um, so e all of these nucleophiles either have negative charges or they have lone pair electrons, and therefore they're going to go looking for some nucleus, some partial positive charge to attack. Um, so this is also listed roughly in the order of increasing nucleophilicity, which is another really tough word to say. I'm going to have to say it a bunch of times. Nucleophilicity. Um, and so when these compounds attack a nucleophilicity, a nucleus, a center of positive charge, they have either those lone pair electrons or the full full-on negative charge here uh, and this causes them to form a new bond. When they attack they can actually form a new bond at the carbon where they attack and so this is where we get actual chemical reactions with bonds breaking and forming. So the classic example is the SN2 reaction. Here's methyl bromide as our substrate gets attacked by hydroxide comes in so the methyl bromide has that partial negative charge Ooh, that was bad and the carbon has its partial 
positive charge, so this is the nucleus, the nucleophile goes in and attacks at this point because of the partial positive charge. Hydroxide has a negative charge, it's a good nucleophile, goes in and attack. You get the, the, the uh, penta-coordinated carbon intermediate, which is sterically strained, and then the OH group stays and the bromide gets kicked out and you're back to, instead of having methyl bromide now, you've got methyl alcohol. And the, the, the negative charge on the OH group has now gone to form this new bond, right? So we need a leaving group. The common leaving groups can be things like halides. Uh, can you hear that in the background? They're jackhammering out the slab in the back of my house. It's awesome. <laughs> you know, I, I thought they were done for the day. Oh, well, uh, maybe you can't hear it. Maybe you're like, what the heck is she talking about? So you need a common leaving group. Halides make really good leaving groups. So chloride, bromide, iodide, they make good leaving groups. Alcohol moieties, phosphates, things like that make good leaving groups. Anything that will form a stable species in the aqueous solution that, that's, you know, it's being kicked out into. Uh, and so we can judge how good a leaving group is by looking at its pKa. The lower the pKa, the better the leaving group. So here's some examples from your textbook. Table 13.2, here's methyl bromide reacting with water to form methanol. Methyl bromide is actually used as an environmentally relevant chemical. It's used as a nematocide to kill nematodes. Uh, methyl chloride could be attacked by hydrogen sulfide to give a methane thiol or something also could also be called methyl mercaptan. Methyl mercaptan is one of the things that makes swamps smell bad. They also make uh, sewage treatment plants and sewers smell bad. All those thiols are what makes it smell bad. Uh, then you've got this trimethylphosphate backbone. This is the, the sort of the backbone of the organophosphorus pesticides. And uh, they ha so they have this backbone. They can be attacked by water. The water splits off this group right here. That leaves as a methanol. And you're left with this dimethylphosphate stuff. Uh, you can also have an elimination reaction. So this is substitution. The bromide is gone and it's been substituted by an OH. Same th thing here. The chloride is gone, been substituted into an SH. But you can also have elimination reactions where instead of substitution, it's just, it's not being substituted with anything, it's just gonzo, right? So here we start out with four chlorines, 1, 1, 2, 2, tetrachloroethane. And what you can have is you pull off, see if you have an OH minus here, you've got a hydroxide, it pulls off a proton, so now it's H2O, and it also pulls off a chloride. So you started out with tetrachloro, now you're just a trichloroethane. And notice you have a double bond now. It's a single bond here, now suddenly it's a double bond. And we know, right, from our um, basic chemistry classes that the charge has to balance on both sides of this equation. So we have a negative charge here and we have a negative charge there. So if there's any redox going on, we know that it's a full redox reaction. Both halves of the reaction are there together. Uh, in this case, there isn't actually any redox. It's just an elimination mechanism. Then we can have ester hydrolysis. So this is the ester functional group. You remember that from your organic chemistry. I'm sure you all do. You remember it so well. Uh, and so this is the partial positive charge here on this carbon because the, the two oxygens are withdrawing electron density and making it partially positive. So that is the site of the attack. The nucleophile is going to attack right there. And it will kick out this thing as the leaving group. And you get acetate and ethanol here. Here's parathion, which is an important pesticide. Um, again, it's got that, that phosphorus linkage, so similar to the trimethylphosphate we're looking at over here. It's similar, except that it has this big um, aromatic ring with a nitro group on it. And so the attack is here at the phosphorus. Boom. Um, nucleophile comes in here. This part gets kicked out. The oxygen here is coming from the hydroxide, and you get 2-nitrophetol as your, one of your products. And then we have also things that are called carbamate pesticides. They're different types of, you know, agricultural chemicals. They have this general structure. This one's called carbofuran. Same idea. This carbon here has a partial positive charge because the two oxygens are pulling electron density away from it. So the nucleophile will come in and attack right here. Uh, and this is interesting because what happens is it actually breaks into three parts. You break the bond here and you break the bond here and you end up with your amine, your CO2, and your this thing, blah, 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 dihydroxy 33 dimethyl 7 benzofuranol, because I'm sure you, you had that all figured out. Um, but the point is, 
again, that each of these chemicals has a partial positive charge. And the nucleophile attacks at that point and kicks out some sort of leaving group. Sorry, pause there, right there. Um, and the nucleophile comes in, kicks out some sort of leaving group, and then sometimes the nucleophile sticks around, as here, so it's a substitution reaction, or sometimes the nucleophile just pulls the stuff away and disappears, and you have an elimination reaction. So um, nucleophilic reactions are the generic term. Hydrolysis is one type of nucleophilic reaction. And because water is so abundant, obviously it's going to be a very, very important nucleophile. So in, in our world, in the real world of environmental chemistry, um, reactions where water or OH substitutes for the leaving group are very common and we call those quote-unquote hydrolysis. Now environmental chemists are not very careful in their terminology in general and they throw around the word hydrolysis to mean a lot of different things. And a lot of uh, chemists, environmental chemists, don't really know what happens but they say, oh I threw this chemical into water and it disappeared so that must be hydrolysis. So we use this term hydrolysis, you know, pretty pretty uh, loosely, but, but, but to be specific, a hydrolysis reaction is one, it's a nucleophilic reaction where water is the nucleophile. And because if it's a substitution reaction, you're substituting something like a chlorine or a bromine for an OH group. And as a result, the products of the reaction are going to be more polar. You know, if we go back here, we see we went from methyl bromide, which is pretty nonpolar, to methanol, which is quite polar. Right? This thing, as it stands, is relatively nonpolar, but when you divide it up, now you've got a phenol here, that's quite polar, you got an amine, which is quite polar, and you got CO2, which can dehydrate and give you carbonate. Um, so th these things ended with really very polar products. And so something like methyl bromide that's nonpolar, that might be volatilizing away, but once you convert it into methanol, it's not going to volatilize, because methanol has a very low Henry's Law constant. If this was happening inside your human body, the methyl bromide would be partitioning into your fatty tissues, whereas methanol would probably stay in your bloodstream. Remember your midterm exam. We talked about that on the midterm, about how, how uh, chemicals partition within your body. So this process of hydrolysis converts these nonpolar chemicals into things that are much more polar, and that has big implications for their fate. So the thermodynamics of these reactions, this is why we had the lecture, uh, th there was a review of thermo. Uh, we know that you can calculate the equilibrium constant of the reaction as products divided by reactants at equilibrium, and that that's equal to the EXP of the minus delta G of the reaction over RT. And the point here is that some of these reaction break th these equilibrium constants, excuse me, can get really, really large, so this is pretty big. Um, now, uh, the, the standard way of doing this in regular chemistry is to assume one molar concentration of everything. One molar bromide is a heck of a lot of bromide. You don't run into that very often in the real world. One molar protons is ridiculous, right? That's a pH of zero, and you just don't run into that in the real world. So instead, let's, let's substitute in some reasonable values here. Let's say that bromide is about 10 to the minus 3 molar and the pH is 7, so that the proton concentration is 10 to the minus 7. Then for this, this reaction, the hydrolysis of bromoethane, we get a ratio of methanol to, to methyl bromide of about 10 to the 15th, right? 9.6 times 10 to the 14th, which is close to 10 to the 14th, which is 1 times 10 to the 15th. So that's ginormous, which means that this chemical reaction is going pretty much to completion where everything is going to be con converted into the alcohol and there's not going to be very much of the bromide left. So, so keywords here, spontaneous and irreversible. Irreversible means that the, the equilibrium constant is so huge that you go all the way to products and you have almost no reactants left. Here's another example. This is the hydrolysis of this uh, ester functional group with water. You get, um, uh, this would be acetate and ethyl alcohol as your products. The delta G of this reaction is 19 kilojoules per mole. Delta G is positive, and you would say, wait a minute, positive delta G is not favorable. But again, you have to think about this in terms of the, the true um, concentrations of protons, right? So if I just do this, you know, the uh, EXP to the negative delta G over RT, then my equilibrium constant comes out to be 4.7 times 10 to the minus 4. 
but remember, that's assuming one molar concentration of protons, which is ridiculous. If we instead substitute in a pH of 7, which is 10 to the minus 7 over here, then we, you know, getting rid of the protons, moving them over here, now our equilibrium constant is 4.7 times 10 to the 3. So now products are much more abundant than reactants by, by three orders of magnitude. So you just got to be a little bit careful with those delta G values and remember that um, it's true that, that regular chemists uh, would do the products over reactants and then consider one molar concentration of everything, but we live in the real world where protons are around 10 to the minus 7 molar and things like chloride, you know, if you're in seawater, the chloride is 0.5 molar, uh, the bromide is around 10 to the minus 3. All right, so you guys should remember your uh, nucleophilic displacement of halogens at saturated carbon. You should remember your SN2 mechanism and your, and your SN1 mechanism. And as a, uh, as a reminder, I'm going to show you this fancy schmancy video. If you can get past the music, which is really, really grating in my opinion, um, you're going to really, really enjoy this.